Hey, check it out. Physical copy of something this time. Square Pushers Ultra Visitor. Let's talk about this guy. What's going on, everybody? This is Sean of Ross Like Music. Today, I want to talk about this album right here. This is Square Pushers Ultra Visitor, released on Warp Records on March 8th, 2004. Regarded by some as one of Square Pushers' best albums, if not his best album in his entire catalog. Today, I wanted to share my thoughts and opinions of this album with you guys and let you know if I'm on the same page as everybody else. So, with that being said, yeah, let's talk about this guy. Given that this album has Tom Jenkinson's face plastered on the cover of it, there's a sense that this might be as most personal and intimate album in his entire catalog. Yet through several interviews that I've heard and read from this time period, that doesn't seem to be the case at all. In an interview with ID Magazine from back in 2004, he said of the album that it is his spectacle of beauty and terror. It is unknowable and will never be understood by anybody, least of all its creator. And during the course of the interview, he seems kind of contemptuous for his listening audience. Take a look at this quote right here. But then again, in another interview that he did for this album with BBC Radio's Marianne Hobbs in 2004, he expands on his feelings on the album, his own music, and how it's perceived. Take a listen for yourself. All right, this is the first thing that I wanted to talk to you about, the new album, Ultra Visitor. Yeah. Um, the listener's obviously very familiar with it. You yourself have said it's your spectacle of terror and beauty, okay. and it's unknowable and will never be understood by anybody, least of all its creator. <laughs> right -o. well, um, yeah, I mean, essentially that is exactly what I think and what, what I should probably say is that the fact that I've had to do um, interviews concerning sort of my work over my career has gradually pointed out to me that there is actually no way of literally understanding a piece of music. And in that sense, I've always sort of found myself on the back heel trying to sort of field questions as opposed to answering them because I'm not actually really sure ultimately what to say about a piece of music which has um, been created in an essentially uh, a state of mind which isn't being governed by rational processes. You, in the process of composition, I think certainly what happens when I make music is that I give myself over to some a process which, although I don't want to romanticise it, I would say that it is definitely a different process to say the uh, the state of mind that you're in when you conduct a normal conversation or if you were to be writing something or, or kind of, I don't know, trying to understand a sort of a problem of mathematics or logic or something. It's, it's actually a process which seems to require a separate state of mind, shall we say. Mm. So in that sense, yeah, it's actually a waste of time to try to understand it and for me to try and explain it to try and say well other than using you know like a kind of analogy like a, a spectacle of beauty or terror this is the problem you know you kind of you're in an interview situation and you think what have I actually got to say I mean I've got loads <laughs> to say about loads of other stuff yeah. but about my music the central issue the, the the more central the conversation becomes the more you'll find me saying well that's kind of the way it is. Mm, that, that's totally fair, dude. And my, my point to you would be, though, is it really important, do you think, for people to understand it? Is it not well, just enough to love a piece of music? Yeah, I think that there is a problem in the sense that music made today is made using machines which are founded on the principles of logic, i.e. computers. So there is a danger for you to become a sort of mirror of that machine and think, OK, you make music in this sort of process where you might be kind of uh, working out an equation as opposed to mm. trying to actually sort of go beyond these kind of didactic processes. So it's an unprecedented time in that sense. And there's an unprecedented access to music making facilities. But there's also an unprecedented risk in that we could just fall into becoming a subset of a machine, you know. Mm. A thing that merely facilitates a machine's architecture, makes it illustrates a machine's architecture. All that being said, the reviews for this album were largely positive, earning it a respectable 74 Metacritic, and some of it calling his best work up until that point. But where do I stand on this album? To me, this is probably like the most complete picture of all of Square Pusher's work up until 
until this point in all the releases in his catalog. Everything from even the earliest Spy Mania stuff up until now is in some shape or form contained on this record, but I'd actually say that the real jumping off point for this record for me is Selection 16. And the reason that I say that is the more electronic bass sound that he started using on that album is primarily the framework and the foundation for this record. So there's a lot of those more drum machine sounds that he was using on that album. A lot of the synth sounds on here sound the same. And also there's this mix that he sort of hinted at a little bit on Selection 16 of live instrumentation meeting the more electronic sounds of an album like Go Plastic and also Do You Know Square Pusher, all sort of combining together to create this, this is me and this is my work, artistic statement of an album. Now, I don't know if Tom Jenkinson agrees with that assessment himself, but that's how I kind of look at this picture. It is a encapsulation of everything that he had done up until this point. And I gotta say, in general, I absolutely love this album. The parts on here that actually work, work extremely well. Well, compositionally, this is some of the best stuff that Square Pusher has ever done. Even with the sort of epic length tracks on here with a lot of songs breaching or exceeding the eight minute mark, most of them have such a dynamic composition, arrangement, and flow to them that they never get old and they're always really, really interesting. In fact, the album starts off on one of the biggest highlight moments on the entire album. The title track, Ultra Visitor, busts out the gate almost immediately immediately hits you over the head with those same breakneck speed drum breaks, the fluid rubbery bass lines that kind of combine a little bit of his jazz fusion background as well as some of his more acidic electronic influences that have shown up a little bit on some of his other projects. And the breakdown that hits halfway through is borderline religious. The powerful organ on here just creates this atmosphere that's intoxicating and does a great job of really building the hype and really getting you excited for the rest of the, the album. And the rest of the album in its highlight moments doesn't break from that either. Iambic Nine Poetry is one of the most emotionally affecting and most melodically beautiful tracks that he's ever done that starts off on this beautiful melodic riff that explodes as the the track progresses and the way that the drums start off with a pretty standard groove and then progressively getting more complex as the track climaxes really just shows off that Square Pusher really does have a knack for composition and arranging and should definitely get more credit for his uh, ability as an arranger. And then one of my favorite moments on here, the track 50 Cycles, is this really, really cool glitched out electronic based hip-hop track with Tom Jenkinson not spitting some of the most interesting rhymes in the world, but there's still this really cool, creepy, haunting, disgusting, grimy atmosphere that persists throughout the track before it turns into this absolutely incredible jaw-dropping drill and bass track that gets progressively more insane before it just sort of peters off at the end. Those three highlight tracks that I just mentioned really set the bar high for the rest of the album. And I don't think that the rest of the album quite hits those amazing moments that kicked off this project. There are still really cool tracks on here as well. Steinbolt might be the hardest, most disgusting, foul track he's ever released. It's gritty, harsh, maybe the closest thing he's ever done to a metal track. It's brutal, uncompromising, and it's even more pulverizing than anything that he put out on Go Plastic. And that right there is saying a lot. District Line 2 is probably the closest thing to anything from Go Plastic on this album that starts off very evocative of a train whizzing around the, a city before it turns into this acid-driven drill and bass track that feels like there could be a few more interesting twists and turns in it. But overall, it's still a really cool track. Tetrasync is very similar to Iambic Nine Poetry, 
but what it does differently is it, while it starts off very organic with that live instrumentation, it quickly morphs into a drill and bass track with live instrumentation. And it was always that blending of the more electronic side of Square Pusher's music and his more the live side of Square Pusher's music. And it's that blending of the live side of Square Pusher's music and the electronic elements coming together that I think makes this one of the best tracks on here. It is a super dope track. It's the longest one on here. And it is one of my favorite tracks on here. Tom Ebb Help Us, a wonderful sequel to the melodic ambient highlight track from Go, 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 Go Plastic, somehow manages to be just as emotionally effective, if not even more sad and dour of a track. And it, it, it's one that really sort of haunts the end of the album. But then things pick up with Every Day I Love, which is this beautiful mix of like classical style guitar playing with him on bass. And it's melodically satisfying. It's kind of hopeful. And after some of the dark territory that this album goes into, it really leaves things off on a positive note and really makes you feel good about listening to this album. But honestly, guys, I gotta say, my main problem with this album is it's just so long. This album feels bloated for no reason, and it really does feel like this is Square Pusher being sort of indulgent, because there's a good section of this album that I could really do without. Specifically, an arch pathway, which is supposed to be just sort of a transitional interlude track, just feels aimless and noodly and doesn't really do anything. On top of that, it's not even pleasant to listen to. It's just harsh bass and effects wankery, and it really sort of bogs down the middle of this record. And there's some other bass interludes on here that are just kind of fine. They don't really add anything to it. With the exception of the track I Fulcrum, which is the interlude between Ultra Visitor and Iambic Nine Poetry, that's a perfectly fine track. It's just brief enough that it doesn't really affect the flow of the album and actually does a pretty good job of segueing from the drill and bass sounds to the more live music sounds. There's a bunch of other interlude tracks on here that are just meh, don't really do anything. Another track on here, Menelik. I think that's how you say it. It's just kind of fine. It doesn't really do anything except sort of bog the album down. And when it comes down to it, I think if you really just sort of cut out those little filler tracks, whether you do it yourself and just sequence it, you have what is a largely an exceptional release from Square Pusher that's just bogged down by too much shit that doesn't need to be there. But even with all that extra flab, I absolutely love this album. I think it's one of Square Pusher's best. I think think it falls into square pusher essential territory. It's one of the albums that I'd recommend to everybody. And in some ways, while I said Hard Normal Daddy was probably the most accessible square pusher project and that Feed Me Weird Things was probably one of the more honest portrayals of square pusher's music, this is probably the most honest, complete picture of a square pusher project you will ever hear. Because basically everything that's done on here, he does on every album after this. And it pretty much was the release for Square Pusher for everything that would follow after this. I think that was redundant, but we'll keep it in anyways. So with all that being said, let's get to that tier list. And as much as it pains me, it falls just short. I was going to put it, I was going to put it in the, I was going to put it in the S class territory, but for me, it falls just short and I think I'm going to squeeze it just barely into A, please don't come after me for that. But like all things in life, all good things must come to an end. And we're kind of headed into the dark period of Square Pusher for here on out. So uh, we'll see how people perceive these reviews moving forward. But with all that being said, so that's going to be it for me today, guys. Thanks as always for watching. If you've listened to this album for yourself, please let me know what you thought about it down in the comments. If you want to hear this album for yourself, please head over to my WordPress blog because that's where I post music links to any of the albums that I talk about on this channel. Make sure you're here for Live from the Record Room, my weekly live stream where I play records like the ones that I talk about on this channel, as well as a whole host of records 
records in my collection that I don't get a chance to talk about here. And make sure that you follow me over on Twitter because that is the best way to figure out when I am going live. Links to everything, as always, down in the description. But that's gonna be it for me today, guys. Thanks as always for watching, and I will catch you in the next video. So until then, peace out!